as we gather together for worship the Lord is compassionate and gracious slow to anger abounding in love he will not always accuse nor will he harbour his anger forever he does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities for as high as the heavens are above the earth so great is his love for those who fear him as far as the east is from the west so far has he removed our transgressions from us as a father has compassion on his children so the lord has compassion on those who fear him for he knows how we are met how we are formed he remembers that we are dust as for man his days are like the grass he flourishes like a flower of the field the wind blows over it and it is gone and its place remembers it no more but from everlasting to everlasting the lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children and with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. Let's pray as we 
come together, our loving Heavenly Father, compassionate and gracious, abounding in love, we worship you, the one who doesn't treat us as our sins deserve, the one who has removed our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. May our worship be acceptable to you, we pray, for the glory of your name. Amen. Let's sing together, love before the dawn of time. Now if you'd like to turn in your... children's club under conviction of sin and I just knew I had to do something and that night I prayed and I've been following Christ ever since but here's the thing the next day I can only describe what I had as a bubble of joy within me and it lasted for a few days never had it since uh, but over those few days 
I, I, I distinctly notice it begin to diminish until it left me. Uh, now, I repeat, you may not have had that experience. That's fine. Uh, may have been nothing like that. That's okay. But this is what mine was. Uh, but I, I know why it deflated, if I can use that word. Uh, I had four siblings, so it was a boisterous household. I had schoolmates who didn't respect my faith. Uh, the sin that Christ died on the cross for, uh, I realised was ever present in my life. And slowly, what I believe to be this this blessing from the Holy Spirit dispersed. And what we see here, well, uh, we've seen an image of a person under the weight of sin in the slavery of Egypt. Oh, a person might say, well, I love my life. I don't need a saviour. What's all this talk about? I'm fine. I had a series of conversations during lockdown with a person who thought just that. Uh, to this day, uh, they, they, they don't come to church. Uh, it's not always like that. Sometimes a person will live in utter misery because of their sin. And it still doesn't mean to say they turn to Christ. But when we leave the misery of Egypt, Deuteronomy 4 puts it this way. The Lord took you and brought you out of the iron smelting furnace, out of Egypt. We've left the misery of our sinful lives by the blood of the Lamb of God through those deep waters of death into life and we are saved and we've learned to sing praise uh, maybe with this bubble of joy but soon we realise the battle with sin is still very real and we've seen battles within Further along the way we come across opposition, we learn that this journey we are on is tough. We will face real difficulties as Christians. We've seen all of that. Now the next stage is difference, but it's still relevant, of course. It's still part of the pilgrim journey that we're on. Uh, we've seen something that happens, now we see something we must do. So something we've seen something that happens to us. Now we see something we must do. And quite simply, it's no big deal. It's telling others along the way about the journey that we're on. We will see Moses bearing witness to God's saving power and grace. So the first thing we see, uh, verses 1 to 6, we see Jethro's arrival. Now Jethro, the priest of Midian and father-in-law of Moses, heard of everything God had done for Moses and for his people Israel and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Now there's a few things here that are a bit unclear. What sort of priest was he? Who was he sacrificing to? Now of course everybody sacrificed to some God or another at some point uh, back then. Probably stretches back to Noah when he sacrificed after the flood uh, and this knowledge that he had carried through the ark, if you like, of uh, of sacrificing over your sins, uh, would have been dispersed at Babel. And as the people separated and went their separate ways, they also took this knowledge with them. And over time it was twisted uh, and they ended up worshipping all sorts of made-up gods and sacrificing to them. And Midian, uh, uh, big pardon, Jethro is part of that. But as we read through the Old Testament, uh, we will soon realise that Midianites are no friends of Israel. So what's going on here? Well, I think we see here is what happens when a person comes to faith. Or at the very least, when a person begins the journey. The Bible doesn't outrightly tell us as to Je Jethro's spiritual status before God. But we have a few big clues and, and actually... Maybe I think we can be more positive than I've just said. Uh, we see that there seems to be a name change, although it's not clear when this happened. In chapter 2, when Jethro is first introduced 40 years earlier, uh, he uses... Uh, he uses the name... Uh, so, so the name we're given, Moses uses the name Ruel. But now he's Jethro. And are we to read anything into that? I think so, because Ruel means friend of God. And my suspicion is that Moses puts it there 
uh, writing well after the event, puts it there to set a marker that this man who he's writing about in chapter 2 and then in chapter 18 will at some point become to be a friend of God. Now, straight away, isn't that exciting? We serve a holy God. Remember Isaiah 6? Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. 2 Timothy 6, verse 16. He alone is immortal and lives in unapproachable light whom no one has ever seen or can see. Yet we can be his friend. This is the difference with Christianity. Our unapproachable God, unapproachable light, becomes approachable through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he can be our friend. Isn't that wonderful? You might say, but you don't know how bad I am. Well, Jesus does, incidentally. Uh, when Jesus comes, they call him a friend of sinners. And that was in a critical, mocking way. You know, look at this Jesus, he'll befriend anybody. And when you see some of the company that he kept, it doesn't matter how bad you are, there is forgiveness at the cross. So Moses fled Egypt and was away for 40 years. Uh, did he say nothing to his wife Zipporah? I can't imagine that at all. Did he not say anything about the God of the Bible? Did he discuss these things with his pagan father-in-law Jethro? Perhaps Jethro would say, would you like to sacrifice to my God? Surely they would have had conversations. We know they did have some conversations. Uh, we, we read one son was named Gershom for Moses said, I've become an alien in a foreign land. Now, that's just the cry of a man without a country. But look at verse four. And the other was named Eli Azor, Eli Ezer, for he said, My father's God was my helper. He saved me from the sword of Pharaoh. Now you don't have children and not celebrate their birth. No doubt Jethro organised a great big party, and you can imagine the conversations about Eliezer's name. Who is this God? Who is your helper? Who saved you? Saved you from what? We don't know how old the children were at this stage, but I'm sure Moses had told Jethro over those 40 years something of the God of the Bible. Now, I don't know. Uh, was Moses content to be a shepherd now until he died? Was he still holding out that God would deliver his people? I don't think there's any indication that he has turned his back on the God of the Bible at all here. Surely, he would have told his wife, if not Jethro of creation, the biblical account of, of Noah, of Abraham. Uh, and I think that God's word is working on Jethro's heart. And then most clearly we get to our chapter today and we read verse one that Jethro heard of everything God had done for Moses and for his people Israel and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Now, Moses' wife and sons, for whatever reason, had been with Jethro for a while. Um, I'm sure that was only temporary. And, and, and whether the case is that Moses had sent for them or Jethro had come and, uh, to see this situation, uh, Jethro seems to be making this move, coming to faith by the word of God. We read in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. This powerful word of God works in the life of a person and draws them to Christ. Now, there's two ways we see here. Look at the first way and then pick up on the second way further on. But the first way we see, we'll see it again in Rahab's life, um, in Joshua, plying her trade, do you remember, as the Jericho prostitute? Probably at the moment, just a child, maybe not even born. But as the whole region is hearing of Egypt and what God has done there, traders presumably uh, up and down the, the, the trade routes, Rahab will grow up hearing the same things. And slowly she will come to faith like Jethro before her through the word of God being gossiped around the region. 
I think that's amazing. Just snippets of uh, information that they pick up uh, and God's word is active. As traders pass through, they tell us strange goings on in Egypt. Perhaps a few Amalekites report on what happened. Water from the rock, that strange manner they eat. What I love about both Rahab and Jethro is that it isn't them sitting down and doing a Christianity Explored or getting a scroll and reading the Bible even. What little of it there was in this conversation about God that is happening throughout the region after Egypt's devastation working on their hearts. Don't underestimate the power of God's word. It's great to read it, to memorise it, to share it as best you can. And you might think you've mangled your attempts to share your faith. But the Spirit of God loves the Word of God and he will use it to bring people to himself. Now, I often wonder how, uh, verse 6, we, 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 I, I often wonder how, how they could send word around back there. No phones, anything like that. Was it some guy literally wandering around until he found them? No idea. But nevertheless... They meet up and we see a bit more of this process. Uh, now, we, we see the second way, actually, not really that different from the first way, but perhaps more detail, a more, a more um, focused witness of God's word, we might say, than the vague chatter of traders. So let's look at this. Uh, verses 7 to 8, Moses shares the gospel. Now, firstly, I love the respect Moses shows to his father-in-law. Uh, Moses is now the leader of a nation. Uh, but he's a humble man and shows respect to his pagan father-in-law. He could have said nothing. There's always an excuse, isn't there, not to share the gospel. But I think Moses had determined in his heart to let Jethro know. And we read in verse 8, Moses told his father-in-law about everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake and about all the hardships they had met along the way and how the Lord had saved them. So this second way, uh, the second, uh, whatever, that, that, Je that Jethro comes to faith. Basically, it's Moses reading Exodus to him. Moses shared the Old Testament gospel with Jethro. Now, gospel is a New Testament word, uh, but I think it's helpful to use it here. I picked this up some years back as to how Moses might share the gospel or, or how an Israelite might share the gospel. We were in a foreign land. We were in bondage under the sentence of death. But our mediator, the one who stands between us and God, came to us with the promise of deliverance. We trusted in the promises of God, took shelter under the blood of the Lamb, and he led us out. Now we're on our way to the promised land. We're not there yet, of course, but we have the Lord to guide us. And through blood sacrifice, we also have his presence in our midst. So he will stay with us until we get to our true country, our everlasting home. Now that's pretty much our gospel, isn't it? Isn't that what we might share with an inquiring mind? He shared the gospel. He shared the good news with Jethro. Let's be those who share the good news that we have with the people we know, with the people we come across. Romans 10 14 says, then how then can they call on the one they've not believed in? How can they believe in the one of whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without somebody preaching to them? This is what Moses is doing. And it's what we should be doing. Oh, we will muddle our words up. We will feel stupid. We will feel embarrassed. But the work is God's. In effect, they're saying that this is what the Lord has done for me. I love... Um, I love what has been said of evangelism, of sharing our faith, um, how it is one man telling another where to find bread. Let's share the gospel. And then what do we see the result is in verses 9 to 12? We see in verse 9, Jethro was delighted to hear about all the good things the Lord had done for Israel in rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. Now, at this point, I'm reminded of a response I've heard before. I remembered this couple who, who said once, we admire your faith. Now, um, I have no idea where this couple are today, either physically or spiritually. No idea. 
Uh, they might just as well be out there admiring a Sikh's faith or a Muslim's faith or an Amalekite or a Canaanite's faith. I admire your faith. It means nothing. Being delighted in the gospel, admiring somebody's faith, doesn't mean a thing unless you act upon it. Being interested, admiring somebody's faith is nice and sounds respectful, but at the end of the day, if it stays that way, it's worthless. I would argue that to say you're delighted in somebody's faith in God, but do nothing about it, it means that you haven't understood it at all. What we see in Jethro, however, is an acknowledgement that this faith is true. He believes the message and this is what we see here in verse 10. Praise be to the Lord who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and the Pharaoh and who rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians. He's delighting in it. He's delighting in what God has done. I've got to say it. We're nearly at the end of the year. Psalm 111, our psalm for the year. I hope it's blessed you. It's blessed me. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. That's what Jethro is doing about 400 years before this psalm is written down. That's what, that's what has got him to this place, delighting in the great works of God. Here in the gospel, being drawn towards this beautiful saviour will change a person's life or you've not been drawn towards him. And we also see this, this, we also see another huge shift in Jethro's thinking. Thinking, in verse eleven, he says, "For I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods, for He did this to those who had treated Israel arrogantly." Back then, throughout Old Testament history, indeed, still in many parts of the world today, the gods were geographical. If you were passing through a region, you sacrificed to the gods. Uh, so, sorry, to the gods of that region, hoping that they would give you a safe journey. Do you remember we saw this in, uh, in Jonah? How the sailors in the boat quizzed Jonah and were horrified when Jonah said, I'm a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the land. Now, specifically for them, you're running away in a boat, sailing away in a boat from the God of the sea. How stupid is that? Now, of course, nowadays, many don't even believe in God. How stupid is that? But Jethro had been on a spiritual journey and he has realised something deep, that the Lord is greater than all other gods. So the gods of Midian, the gods of the Malachites, the gods of the Canaanites, the Lord is greater than all other gods. He's come to faith. He believes God. Now, his theology wasn't perfect. He is, in effect, a, a new believer. And what new believer gets everything right? What old believer gets everything right? Did he still believe that there were other gods? It's not clear. But certainly he believed that the one true God was the one true true God and let's be honest it's just bubbling over perhaps he has that bubble of joy that I had Jethro has put his faith in the God of gods and he is filled with joy Jethro believed God isn't that wonderful we see this great conversion now we see one more important thing here then Jethro Moses is Moses father-in-law brought a burnt offering and other sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law in the presence of God. He sacrificed a burnt offering and other sacrifices to God. In a few months this will be forbidden. There will be a, a priesthood. There will be a tabernacle. There will be an official way to sacrifice for your sins. But for now, this is the way. Uh, your own personal sacrifice. A bit like the patriarchs, they would they would uh, raise altars. And, and I, I, I suspect that's what's going on here. Uh, and the sacrifice was to cover over the sins that Jethro had committed. And I presume all the others who were with him. Um, later on, we read in 
Hebrews 9 verse 22, that the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Blood is messy, sticky. You don't want it to cover anything, do you? It stains even. Blood doesn't make anything clean. Wrong. It is the most powerful cleansing agent known to man to clean the most deepest, dirtiest of stains known to man. Man's sin. Isaiah says um, in chapter 2, uh, we must be too bogged down with all the different colours here. But come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. And here we see that an animal is sacrificed for Jethro's sin. Because of sin, something died. And actually, that isn't the end of the story either. The story starts in Eden, when after Adam and Eve sinned, that they were clothed with what? Well, with garments of skin. Now, God could have made skin garments out of the dust of the ground, uh, just like that. But I don't believe he did. The pattern throughout the Old Testament that because of sin, something has to die. An animal died because of their sin and they were clothed in that animal's skin. It was a substitute for the sin that they had committed. I wonder if a thoughtful priest throughout the years, throughout the millennia, thought to himself, this doesn't make sense. Oh, he carried on because that's the way that God is led. But surely some would think, how can a lamb cover my sin? All those years later, we read again in the book of Hebrews, it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Jethro's sin at that time was dealt with in a relational sense. He was right with God at that time. How wonderful to be right with God. But that sacrifice was a promise of a future act. It was a pointer. It pointed towards Calvary, where Jethro's sin was ultimately dealt with. Look at the picture we end with today. Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law in the presence of God. Jethro, a Midianite, probably, oh, almost certainly, in some distant way related to the Midianites who sold Joseph into slavery, starting the whole process of 400 years earlier. Ancient enemies finding peace through the blood of the Lamb. Isn't that wonderful? Let me make a comment here. Please don't misunderstand me. Our, our country has a problem with immigration. Certainly people are talking about it. I think there are 4 million Muslims in our country. And of course, other religions. Now, this is the thing. We can see that as a threat. Or we can rejoice in the opportunity and pray that many, too, will come to know Christ like Jethro. And on that last day, stand together before the throne of the Lamb, the throne of our God and worship. Let's pray. Well, let's, let's, um, we're going to sing to close. Um, not quite Christmas, but we are going to sing of Mary's response to this gospel news that she would bear the Lord Jesus Christ. Tell out my soul, but first we will pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for Mary's joy. For the song that she sang at the news of her uh, carrying the, the Christ child. What good news. What a gospel we have. May we share this wonderful news with those across our land who don't know it. With those we meet day by day. We pray that the word of God would reap a great harvest in our nation. And now may this glorious gospel burn within our hearts. May your good spirit embolden us to share the joy that we have of sins forgiven this day because of the Lamb. For the glory of your name we pray. 
Amen.